Welcome to the two masters session for the Butino International Virtual Festival. Thank you very much for joining us. We've had a, an extremely busy morning. Uh, I'm Felix, the Digital Marketing Manager for Butino, um, and I am delighted to welcome Master Sommelier Nigel Wilkinson and Master of Wine Mike Best. And uh, today we're gonna we're gonna have a sort of breakdown as to what a Master Sommelier is, what a Master of Wine is, what what that actually means. Um, since joining Boots, you know, I've got to work with both these guys quite closely. And what's been fascinating is seeing the different ways they approach the work, but also the consistent themes um, that kind of, there's a lot of overlap between the two. And I think as a business for us, having those two different approaches is, is absolutely gold. Us. So um, yeah, less from me, I think straight into the other guys. So Nige, would you be able to introduce yourself and tell us um, what your qualification is, how you came to be, uh, who you are? Fantastic. Thank you very much, Felix. Uh, so, uh, hello, everybody. My name is Nigel Wilkinson. And as Felix kindly said, I'm the master sommelier that works for Boutonneau Wines. So I've been working with Boutonneau now for, well, close to about sort of 20 years. Um, I passed the master sommelier examination in 2005. Uh, and I get the fantastic job of representing a lot of Boutonneau estates globally, plus also a lot of our fine dining accounts here in the UK. And in essence, that's me. Perfect, perfect. And Mr. Best, would you be able to introduce yourself for us, please? Yes, thank you, Felix. Um, yes, so my name's Mike Best, Master of Wine, and uh, I uh, passed the Master of Wine qualification in 2020, so uh, relatively recent addition to the ranks. Um, and um, I've worked for Butino for uh, just about two years. So uh, yeah, uh, it's uh, again, another relatively recent addition to the team. I work in the independence team, so I work on um, customers mostly in the south of England, um, whether they're, they're retailers and some wholesale, and uh, work with all that portfolio, which is which is great. Perfect. So let's uh, let's dive into those backgrounds. Nige, um, how did you become or how did you come to be a master sommelier? I believe it started in a hotel in Wales somewhere. Well, that's right. Yeah. So so my my sort of introduction to wine, if you like, is is sort of I I, I think it's a nice story. So uh, when I was younger. Um, I'm from Wrexham in North Wales. Wrexham's not really a sort of uh, hotbed for, uh, for wine. Uh, but um, when, when I was younger, when I was 16, 17, I, in the UK, I, I was studying for my A-level exams. And the plan was always to go to university and study sports science because I was quite sporty when I was younger. Uh, and whilst I was studying for my A-levels, I, I started a part-time job in a local hotel, a boutique hotel in, in um, a place called Plangothin. In, in North Wales. And uh, in terms of uh, what happened in my, in my life, um, when I went to, when, as I say, I wanted to go to university, uh, but in the UK, you have to get certain grades to go to certain universities. And, uh, you know, at the time, I think Loughborough wanted A's, Durham wanted B's, and then Alsager wanted C's. And to be honest, I was a very sort of average student. So I thought to myself, C's is, is, is what I'll, I'll go for. So as I say, I was working part-time at, this, at this, this lovely boutique hotel, studying for my levels. I did my A-levels and I got a D and an E. Um, so that instantly meant that I wasn't going to university. And I remember going home and speaking to my mum and dad. Um, and they basically said to me, no ifs, no buts, get a job. There and then, get a job. So I panicked and I went back to the hotel that I was working part time. And I asked if I could do a training management program. And they allowed me to do this uh, training management program. And part of the training management program was to look after the wine cellar. And I was really fortunate in the fact that the guy that owned the hotel was a huge wine uh, collector. And um, for me, it was just grape juice. For me, I didn't know the difference at the time between a bottle of Merceau and a bottle of milk. Um, it, would, it meant absolutely nothing to me. But at the tender age of 18, I was basically in charge of this absolutely amazing wine cellar, wines from the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, all the crew class A wines, port going back many, many decades. And I knew absolutely nothing about it. And I remember on the first day going into this uh, amazing underground wine cellar, this old house, and I, I went to the rack with the gentleman who owns the wine cellar and I pulled out of the rack 
this 1927 Shambol Musni that had actually been bottled in the UK. And it was covered in dust. And I remember saying to this guy, seriously, this has got to be out of date by now. And he sort of looked at me with great sort of horror, great shock. Um, and in all honesty, I thought I was going to lose my job. But back then, sort of 30, 40 years ago, we didn't have, you know, an iPhone where I could just sort of take a picture of the label and sort of um, get the information that I needed. Um, so I had to go to the local uh, library and I had to source books. And in essence, sort of, I wanted to know why this one bottle of wine was so special. I wanted to know where it was from, who made it, what grape varieties uh, are involved, the village that it's from, et cetera, et cetera. And so I started this journey and from this one single bottle of wine at the tender age of 18, I developed this passion for, for wine, uh, which then led me on to other things, including uh, the Master Sommelier Diploma um, many years later. So when, uh, when this guy is giving you management of his uh, wine cellar and then you've pulled one out and kind of shown your inexperience, um, what is it do you think that he saw that, made him decide, right, well, I'm not going to take away the keys immediately. Um, what was it about your attitude, your way of working that he felt, right, um, I can build this guy into uh, the you know, wine master that you are now? Well, I, th I think initially it was because I was cheap. Um, <laughs> it, was because, it was because I was honest. Um, I, I, you know, he, he realized that I, that I wasn't going to sort of um, crack open bottles of wine and, and, and drink wine in the cellar, et cetera. So, um, yeah, you know, sort of, I, I was very, very lucky. And I, I, as, as I say, I was, you know, many people say that they're you know, in, the, in the right place at the right time. For me, that was definitely the case, you know. Um, it was a fallback and I sort of, I, I, you know, sort of, I dropped lucky. I really did drop lucky. And mm -hmm. as I say, managing this, this amazing wine cellar just at the tender age of 18, um, just gave me so much sort of inspiration. And every spare minute I would have, I'd be sort of reading up about wine. Uh, again, remember, this is the days before the internet. So, um, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think I was 83, would you? But um, that, that's, that's, the, that's the, uh, the beauty of wine. It, it helps to keep you youthful. Um, yeah. But, um, yeah, so, so in, in essence, that's my story. Um, and I do owe a lot to this gentleman. Um, so it was, it was the Lloyd family. Uh, that owns the establishments at the time. And um, yeah, that, that, that's me. Yeah. And uh, Mike, what about you? What was your introduction to the world of wine? Nigel and I are quite similar in the sense that we're both, uh, both Northerners and both um, uh, worked in hosp uh, hospitality, sort of out, out, uh, fresh out of school and um, fell into wine without actually having sort of a, a family background to it or a connection to it, um, you know, um, <clears throat> there wasn't any any culture of wine drinking really um, in, in, in my house or in anything like that, any real reason to, to, to go into that industry. Um, but yeah, I, I, I got my interest in wine from working in a nice gastro pub in Yorkshire and um, that was what led me on to doing the WSET courses and then uh, got to start working in the wine business and um, it was uh, yeah that was uh, sort of 12 years ago now um, and just remember thinking to myself you know the, when the first see, seeing a, a wine list where uh, with bottles of wine on there for 50 pounds and thinking why would somebody spend 50 pounds on a bottle of wine and trying these wines and then not have and then not tasting like anything that I'd tried before um, and um, that was sort of a whole introduction to me in the in the sort of culinary landscape or the the world of food and wine. You know, never really never having had uh, rare beef before, for example, and it was always cooked through uh, fully at home and 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 sort of yeah, seeing all that sort of stuff. So um, that really was an introduction, and uh, I always enjoyed. Um, being around people and um, the sort of sense of theatre of uh, of working in a in a pub where you have different people coming in and you need to sort of be a different character to, to different to different people and if something phases you or you can't let that let that uh, be shown um, you know people are still coming in to have a have a good time and so on um, so yeah that, that was that was really how it all started and um, yeah from doing those WSET courses just wanting to learn more and um, that that that's really my start yeah. Ooh. 
So there are, there are quite a few parallels, aren't there, between the two? And um, for you, Nige, what does um, what does being a master sommelier mean? Okay, so uh, the term master sommelier. Um, firstly, nobody can just call themselves master sommelier. Uh, it's an examination, and very similar to the WSET, uh, there are four levels in terms of the Court of Master Sommelier's uh, course program. So we start with the introductory uh, or introduction to sommelier. Uh, the next course up is then the certified sommelier. Then we have the advanced sommelier. And then if you are successful at the advanced and you get a good grade, you get invited to uh, take the master sommelier examination. But you have to have all three levels uh, before you get invited. And in terms of the examination, the examination, I'm, I'm sure Mike will probably disagree, but it, it's regard, the Master Sommelier examination is regarded as one of the toughest exams in the world. Um, the first exam was in 1968. And to date, um, we, we only have 266 people that have ever passed the exam. So uh, we, we run two examinations a year, one in uh, Europe, usually in the UK, and one in the States. Uh, each year, you know, sort of, we might get sort of around about sort of 100 candidates sit in the examination. And if we're lucky, we only get about two or three people that actually pass the examination. Well, so, so talk about this test, what's the, what's the challenge? Why is it so difficult? Well, in terms of the examination, the examination is made up of, of three parts. Um, we have a um, practical element. So in terms of the practical element, you have to demonstrate that you can work in a um, fine dining uh, restaurant, that you can, um, you can do service to the required standard. So that might be things like sort of decanting and uh, champagne service. Um, it might be in involve cocktails. Yeah, you know, when I passed the examination, it also involved cigar service, uh, food and wine matching, uh, a whole host of different sort of elements to the, uh, the to the practical task. And then the next part of the examination is the theory examination. And the theory examination uh, is a verbal uh, exam where you go into uh, a room and you, you're faced with um, three, possibly even four masters and they fire questions at you. Um, and in terms of the questions that they, they ask you, it's all weird and wacky stuff, um, nothing straightforward. And like all other three parts, you have to achieve 75%, a minimum of 75%. And then for the tasting element, you have 25 minutes. Again, it's all verbal. So you do this in front of um, a panel of um, uh, masters. Uh, you have three whites three reds, and in that 25 minutes, you have to taste, describe, and identify um, the wines that are in front of you. When I say identify, um, you have to say the grape variety, the country, the region, possible Appalachian or village, vintage, um, and again, sort of, uh, you're, you're, you're very sort of uh, rushed on your time, so it's all sort of verbal, uh, maximum 25 minutes and again you have to achieve 75 percent to, to pass and that's what probably one of the reasons why sort of in the 50 or so years that uh, the examination has been uh, in, in um, taking place uh, only 266 people have ever passed the exam and I'm proud to say I'm the only Welshman to um, pass it. <laughs> the only Welshman so far so far, indeed, yes. Of course. Yes. Um, Mike, what about you? What's the, um, what are the hoops that you've got to jump through to become a master of wine? Um, so in order, to, um, in order to get onto the program, um, you should have something like the WSET diploma or the equivalent, um, although the, the two, um, the two uh, industries, the, 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 the WSET, the organization, and the Institute of Masters of Wine aren't actually the same they're not they're not linked they're close friends but they they don't actually have anything to do with one another officially but the um the first step uh, yeah is to have something like the wsct diploma in order to be on board uh, in order to get onto the program and there's an entrance uh, exam and they've made things maybe slightly harder because the pass rate is also 
very low. So they want to make sure that people who are on the program are um, capable, I suppose, or able um, in the end to, to, to pass the program. And um, the course lasts three years as a minimum. So there's a the stage one um, is basically in order to prepare you for the main exams in the second year. So you have a, a, a day, a one, one sort of day exam where you will do 12 wines and then um, you will um, do two theory papers um, on that day. And then the actual uh, main set of exams um, are three tasting papers. So each tasting paper has 12 wines in it. Paper one, which is mostly whites, um, paper two, which is reds, and paper three, which is could be absolutely anything, including sparkling fortified or really anything. It could be eight Rieslings. Um, so that's that's what happens there. And then there's also five sets of theory papers. Um, so these exams last in total four days. And then if you, um, you can pass the tasting part, and uh, separately and you can pass the theory part separately so if you pass tasting one year but you don't pass theory you can come back the next year and, and take the just the theory part and so the exams happen once a year in in, uh, in san francisco adelaide and london and um, then once you've done that you have to complete a research paper um, which you can choose on any topic you like and i did mine on uh, cellular tourism in the uk but people have done them on absolutely everything. They've done have once on historical, um, you know, parts of the wine trade. They've done them on um, fermentation um, elements or different yeast, or you know, some very very sort of um, you know ones on biology and very scientific or viticulture. Uh, others on business. So um, that's part of uh, the, the final part of the examination. So I suppose between the two, there's a. The, the great thing about the wine trade is there is this deep academic knowledge that that people love getting involved in, but there's also almost like the theatrical practicalities of serving and of delivering it. And it's like between these two qualifications, you guys really cover the entire breadth of the industry there. Is it, do you feel like the Master of Wine one is perhaps a little more academic and the Master Smelly is a little more practical? Um, possibly in the sense that... Um, in the, the so the exams that in the in the master of wine program are, are written um and so you need to be able to express yourself in a in a classical british educational system <laughs> essay style format um there's not a huge degree of flexibility on that format um in terms of how you choose to answer uh, and um it's actually interesting because I, um, as part of now being a master of wine and I'm, I'm mentoring new people into the program. And um, the it, even though in lots of ways our, our language, our communication has changed to become much more informal, you can see it in newspapers, the language is much more informal, yeah. but still the system within educational practices is, is quite formal. And so I've had to sort of remind um, some of my mentees to say, actually, you can't really write it like that because it's, that's not how it would be expressed formally. Um, even though it's probably how you would communicate in a business sense as well, almost um, that because of the way that language has changed. But um, yes, uh, so you do need to not only be able to know the right answer, which is important, but you also need to be able to communicate it as well. And there are different ways of doing that. So it might be that you'd be asked to report um, to make a report on um, a the. I don't know, a, a particular type of vine pruning method. Um, and that could be something that a master of wine may be asked to do as part of their, as part of their work. Um, and that would be written up in a, in a formal report, say, for example. Um, and uh, whereas, you know, there are obviously elements that, which are different for just speaking about ho hospitality and, and the sort of the, the intricacies and the, and the nuances of that, which I'm sure Nigel can tell us some more about. Yeah, what do you think, Nigel? Um, ooh, um, just remind me the question again, sorry. Do you feel like um, the Master Sommelier qualification is a little more on the practicality, on the serving, on almost being a part of the hospitality industry as opposed to being a separate? Is it almost the bridge between the wine industry and hospitality? Well, in terms of the Master Sommelier, unless you're actually sort of um, working in the hospitality industry, um, you, you can't um, sit the exam. I was very lucky in the fact that um, I didn't pass the exam first time. Um, first time I sat the exam, I, 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 I fluked the theory and I fluked the practical, uh, but failed the tasting. I came 
came back year two, failed the tasting again, came back year three, failed the tasting again. So I had to restart the whole program. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of a fourth time round, passed the um, practical and passed the theory, but failed the tasting. Um, <laughs> year five, failed the tasting, finally got the tasting on year six. But because my journey had started when I was involved in hospitality, they allowed me con to continue. Um, but if I wasn't working in the hospitality industry, I wouldn't be able to sit the exam. Yeah. What, what do you guys see as the similarities between the two? When you look at um, the Master Sommelier qualification, Mike, what, what is it that, that you can relate to? I think um, uh, fear uh, of, of, uh, of glasses of wine in front of you with, uh, with, no, with very little information to go on. Um, um, no, I think uh, more seriously, um, the, um, the sort of uh, ability to say the most important thing at, on any given moment is perhaps uh, something that is quite similar in, in, in both cases that you could be asked from anywhere a really strange question about a specific part of the market or about a great variety which is grown in some relatively obscure place or exactly what is happening now in Rioja with the new um, single vineyard system and 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 just a whole hodgepodge of things from from the vineyard to to the business of wine and how different markets around the world operate and uh, which vintages of Bordeaux are now showing in, in a particular way and things like this so it, there's just the um, it's, it's almost like having a huge matrix in your head, which you need to be able to operate on those, like like a tube map going, and you need to be able to get there very, very quickly. And um, so I think that uh, even though the way we then might present that information may be slightly different, I think that um, that is both the things that we uh, that, that, that we have in, in common with the study and everything, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, I agree um, with you. In the fact, you know, sort of, I think the reality is that both Mike and myself, we would regard ourselves as sort of like ambassadors, if you like, for for wine. I, I think sort of between the two of us, we we, we wouldn't sort of claim to know everything, um, but um, it's important because we have to communicate and we have to communicate to our customers. Um, so um, you know, sort of in terms of you know, I, I noticed the questions popped in there with regards to, um, uh, do you have to know everything about wine and how do you keep up to date with all the information? And even though that I passed the exam sort of 16 years ago, I still teach, I still regularly sort of travel. I, um, it's important for me, um, if I'm gonna call myself a Master Sommelier, because because obviously I'm, I'm entitled to do that by passing the examination, but if I'm going to do that, I need to sort of keep up to date with with, with everything. So even in, in an average week, I, I'd probably read a couple of hours about wine from various different regions. I like to know what's happening, uh, always keep uh, on top of things. Um, and, you know, sort of it, it's really, really important that sort of when you do sort of um, get these titles that you don't just sort of, you know, live on the fame of that you know you, you have to be mm. as i said before you have to be an ambassador and you you have to sort of um you know sort of keep up to date with, with everything that's going on as mm -hmm. as ambassadors do you both see that one of the key roles there is to take what can be really complicated information and communicate that clearly to to an audience who might not have the knowledge that you do that's the that's the skill that's what einstein said if you can't explain it simply you don't understand it well enough <laughs> It's a very good point, Mike. It's a very good point. So uh, one of the, in the discuss discussions before this session, one of the um, key things that you both mentioned that was slightly different was your, your approach to, to tastings. So we've, uh, we've got two, two wines, one for each of you to kind of present. Um, Nigel, would you like to go first and explain uh, what the wine is that you're going to be um, tasting, that you're going to be presenting to us and what your approach would be? Okay, so, so almost uh, as a play by play as you go as to what, what the steps are that you're taking as you're going for your tasting. Okay, so in terms of the wine that we're going to be tasting, well, I'm going to be tasting, uh, is the Pablo Iwalta Malbec uh, from Argentina, which is our project uh, collaboration um, between Butano and uh, Walter Brescia. Um, and 
If I was to do this in an exam format, it would take four minutes and I would talk to you about sort of the appearance of the wine. I talk to you about the nose of the wine. I talk about sort of the, um, the, 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 the palates and the structure on the palate. I'd be identifying different flavor um, characteristics. And then um, I would come, you know, with the conclusion, this particular wine is from a particular part of Europe or, or, or part of the new world. I would say that this is, is from a particular region. Um, I would say it was from a particular village, if, if applicable. Uh, I, I'd state the, uh, the vintage um, and I would also give the great variety. Um, but in terms of sort of how I would taste with a customer, um, I think due to the fact that sort of um, from my MS uh, background, firstly, I, I would sort of discuss uh, if the wine is, is good value, uh, if it is a representation of, of uh, what it should be. And um, with regards to the Pablo Walter, you know, it's a fantastic example of unoaked uh, Malbec. Um, I'd also discuss sort of, um, you know, what particular foods this, this wine would go with. Um, I would, you know, sort of, uh, I'd, I'd be make, making recommendations, etc. Um, but it would be in a very approachable, um, easy to understand manner. Um, so, um, so as I say, I, I won't run through the whole sort of four minutes of <laughs> doing the exam with you. Um, but for this particular wine, for the, for the people that have this particular wine in front of them, you know, what I really like about the Pablo Walter is it's very expressive. It's got really good fruit. Um, for me, sort of notes of sort of um, black currant, blackberry, a little bit of blueberry also comes out. I always get with, um, with Malbec um, this lovely sort of floral note. And I think with this particular wine, it has this sort of violets uh, in the background. As I say, there's no oak on this. It, it's, it's a pure expression of the fruit on the uh, Pablo Walter. And in terms of the taste, it's just packed again with, um, with, with upfront forward fruit. It's one of these wines that for me is, you know, it's fantastic value. And this isn't a sales pitch, but it is really is a uh, fantastic value. It's, it's a wine that will go with a whole host of different foods. I think, you know, the classic combination is sort of uh, Malbec and steak, uh, but for me, this would also go with sort of Sunday roast dinners. It would go with um, cheeses, hard cheeses. I think for vegetarians, this particular wine would be absolutely superb with um, anything rustic, so pulses and lentils, or it's just simply one of those wines just to, just to enjoy. So, so that, that's how I would describe this fantastic uh, Pablo Walter Malbec. Going back to when you were an 18 year old who didn't know, uh, you know, a bottle of wine from a bottle of milk, how, how long did it take you to be able to pick up a glass, taste it and have a fair crack at where, what, not just what region it's from, but what village it's come from and whether it is a true expression of that region or if it's a, a bit of a twist on that region. How, how long do you feel like um, you were working at that before you felt comfortable and confident making a call? But, you know, I always like to say, please never, ever think that um, Usain Bolt rocks up at the Olympics every four years and gets handed a gold medal because that's all we see. But the reality yeah. is he's constantly working. He's constantly sort of, um, uh, you know, sort of trying to improve, um, constantly sort of doing sort of um, um, uh, things, whether it be in the gym, whether it be out on the track, et cetera. And it's the same with tasting wines. The more you taste, the better you become. And it's always good as well to have a sound theory knowledge behind that as well. So, you know, we talk about sort of the, um, the exam and having to identify the wines. And people almost think it's a bit of a game and the fact that, you know, it's, it's this, 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 this parlor game where, where you come up with the conclusion of what the wine is. But if you've got a good theory, then, you know, that then imparts your decision. Because looking at this particular wine, you can see that it's a deep red color. So already you're thinking about thicker skin grape varieties. You know, if you give the wine a little bit of a swirl, you will see lots of legs and tears. Some of those legs and tears 
are slightly stained, which would talk about the extraction and talk about the alcohol. So already you know that this particular wine is possibly from a warm climate. So warm climate, then you're talking about a thick skin grape variety. When you smell the wine, it's so fruit forward, so expressive. It has to be something from the new world. Okay, so it's it's you know it's like being a detective, and it's like <laughs> um, sort of getting the clues to come up with you know the suspect. And mm. I think you know sort of as I said before, I, I love this wine. I think it, it's it's a great great expression of of Malbec that that's not going to break the bank. Um, and yeah, it's 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 for me. It's 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 everything that Malbec at this price point should be. What's great is that we're we're doing a new world session after this one and this you picked this yourself we we didn't plant this one so it's yeah it's a nice little teaser trailer for the next session night very well Fantastic. done Good. <laughs> uh, mike what is it that you've got for us okay so i have some garvey um so uh la Bacostina garvey um so a uh Boutineau classic and um take you through the well my approach to uh tasting uh, uh at the mw level um, the, uh, a master of wine who I used to work with, uh, had had a nice expression that said the difference between, um, tasting and drinking is thinking. It's a nice word. <laughs> so, um, it's, uh, I think, I think, and, and, and that's, and that comes back to what Nigel was saying about the, the theory knowledge. So, um, if you, um, when you when you come across people who are good at anything, it could be um, music. You know where people who ha are uh, classically trained musicians, when they listen to a piece of music, they hear things more, many more things than somebody who is not trained in that piece mm. of music. Now, they might say, "Well, I like it," or "I don't like it." I can that music that music makes me feel happy or sad. But in terms of if you weren't trained in it or you didn't have the experience, how would you possibly know? or like watching Formula One with an experienced, uh, someone who's been a racing driver and, and that kind of thing, they, that people will say, he's not gonna make it around that corner, you know, well before the corner emerges because they have so much experience of seeing, you know, what's, what's, what's gonna happen, for, for example. And that just comes from the subtlety of anything that anyone's interested in. Mm -hmm. um, and so in the uh, tasting exam that for the Master of Wine program, uh, it lasts two and a quarter hours for the 12 wines, which seems like quite a generous amount of time considering uh, Nigel only had six, uh, 25 minutes for his six wines. Um, but you do also need to write about 3000 words uh, in that time of justification uh, on questions which vary from origin, which grape variety, how was it made, how would you sell it, Where, which part of the market would it be, would it be relevant for, uh, vintage and, and uh, quality and so on. Um, and um, the, the questions say uh, identify origin as closely as possible. So that might be down to the specific site, even occasionally the specific producer, should that be possible. Um, but it might be that you end up with a, uh, a wine from Southeast Australia and that is as specific as it says on the label. So that's what, you know, that's what the answer is. Um, primarily the exam is a fine wine exam in the sense that most of the wines are um, at, at a higher, higher end, but um, there are some uh, sort of mid and entry level examples too. And, and the reason for that though, is that, um, is that generally speaking, you know, the, the wines at the sort of fine wine of the market are representative of the style generally. So yes, you can get a uh, a uh, Chablis, which is a more entry level price point, but if you want something which is the true expression of what a Chablis is, then you should really be going to a, a you know an, an excellent premier crew or, or even a, a grand crew potentially. Um, so getting into the the Garvey, um, so what I would be looking at first of all in the same in the sense of tasting is is starting in the in, in the same way that I suppose anyone who's done a wine course would would go through is is, is looking at the color and um, if you're uh, thinking about white wines get darker with age and red wines get lighter so if you have a a, um, a white wine which has a deeper color then it would indicate potentially that it has it's, it's older or that it has been aged in an oak barrel or that it is affected by something like botrytis and noble rot and so on um, but this is a uh, fairly pale lemon color, which is quite standard for white wine, which is um, so it, unlike reds where maybe the color can uh, tell you a bit more as a, as a sort of um, pale lemon color, we're probably assuming that this is a, a relatively youthful wine and has had either no or very limited oak 
contact because it's because of that sort of pale lemon color is what you would um, assume. But this doesn't really that doesn't really narrow it down uh, very much to be honest with you. But it's a, it's a start. Uh, we're off the mark, so to speak. And then um, on the nose, we've got a lovely uh, fresh citrus fruit. Um, it's what we would describe as a as a non aromatic grape variety, though, in the sense that this is not uh, really floral like Gewürztraminer um and and so on so it's uh non-aromatic in the sense of varieties like like chardonnay or semillon for, for example um so you can start already eliminating things that it can't be which is almost as important as what it could be and i would operate my tasting in a in a in a sort of hierarchy um so because the primary aim of passing that exam i think is in finishing the paper if you don't finish the paper you haven't got uh, the chance to get all to get the marks which you need um, so my first job is finish the paper the second thing is to write sensible things and so already by saying this is a fresh uh, citrus led unoaked um, youthful white wine i'm already saying sensible things about the wine and maybe picking up some marks um, along the way by saying something that's really quite obvious about the wine um, and uh, so then Let's give it a taste. So we've got a um, sort of vibrant, fresh, high acidity, but it's not um, it's not as racy as you might expect for, say, a you know a Clare Valley Riesling or a, or a Chablis or, or something like that. It has a, a softness and a roundness on the texture um, that indicates more a sort of moderate climate, some stone fruits coming through, and. Um, the uh, thing that would be important, I think, with a wine like this that is um, not perhaps as obvious as where it is, as say a, a Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc would be, something like that, is to what we call funneling, where you think about similar kinds of styles. So, could it potentially be a Gruner Veltliner? Could it potentially be an Albarino? Um, could it be a Suave? And then having logical reasons as to, well, why is it not those things and why is it a Garvey? And it has that, um, that softness, that, that uh, lovely pear fruit, which is something which always comes through to me uh, on 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 agave. Um, there's a little bit of lees as well, which would suggest that this is a better quality than a uh, than a um, more entry level example agave. So they've taken the care to to age this wine um, on the lees and give it that extra bit of texture and palate weight. Um, and then it would be about the justification. So above um, above writing sensible things is to be right or close to right. So um, I'd, I'd you know, I'd like to be in the sort of spectrum of northern Italian um, uh, white wines and uh, potentially, you know, you may say that this is this is Arnais or, or something like that. And it, it, you're getting closer all the time to being right. Um, and um, and then the, uh, the the top of that hierarchy is to add a flourish where you where you possibly can. So if that means you know if if you are in a, a grand cru, or we'll say which grand cru and why uh, and so on. Um, and that would be how I would how I would break down the the the, the approach to the tasting. But um, given that you've got about uh, well three thousand words to write, yeah, for for about twelve wines, you have to try and do that relatively uh, concisely by saying the most important thing all the time. Mm. It's fascinating. It's almost like you are two two detectives from different like different bureaus, just approaching it in a different way. But you're kind of trying to get to the same the same answer, aren't you? Um, yeah. We're we're rapidly running out of time, so I'm just I'm going to wrap up with a um, with a few questions. That's me, Nigel, just ringing you on the other line. Uh, <laughs> um, we've had one question from Spain, which I think is is the the question. Would either of you consider doing the other qualification? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I'm finished with I'm finished with wine exams now. No, I mean I'd, I'd love to. I have a lot of a huge amount of respect for the uh, for the for the for the uh, you know the the, the qualities that uh, you know the, and the MS exam and uh, and the service element as well, which I find you know really fascinating. You know when you see good service, how how amazing that is, and some wonderful hosts uh, and and everything. Um, but uh, there are a few people who've got both. But um, uh, yeah, I am quite happy now to. Really <laughs> yeah, the one cape is enough for you. What about mm. you, Nige? Um, well, yeah, you know, t touching what Mike said there, yeah, there are in fact five people in the world that have MW and MS. Um, and um, for me, you know, when I started off um, studying about wine, sort of as I say, at a very early age, 
Um, I did, actually, in fact, want to go down the MW route. I, I, I did diploma at a very early age. Um, but for me, I, could, I couldn't find sponsorship um, because, as, as Mike can tell you, sort of the, the MW exam is a, is a very sort of costly exam, not only in, in, in terms of sort of uh, the time that you have to put in, but, you know, sort of financially, it's, it's, it's a, um, a very uh, expensive exam to do. And the MS is more, dare I say, sort of certainly more affordable. Um, it's, um, yes, yeah, sort of, it's, it's a more sort of financially approachable exam to sit. Mm. So but would, in answer to your question, would, would I ever sit, would I go back and sit the MW? I think I'm just a little bit too old now. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think I would, um, I don't think I'd pass. I'll be mm. honest, I don't think I'll pass. Um, because I'm, even though I'm very, very passionate about wine, um, it, it would be a huge commitment now. And, you know, Mike passing the MW very recently, very recently, I'm sure Mike can tell you that his life has changed since he's passed in the fact that sort of, uh, it's not, it, it, you know, going back to what I said before, it's not a case of putting the books away, but it's a huge dedication. Yeah. And um, for me now, you know, sort of um, family life's more important and, you know, um, Plus, what I do with the quartermaster sommeliers and the fact that I am lucky to travel and, um, you know, sort of like to teach, as I said, um, I sadly wouldn't have the time to do it now. So just to, to finish up, the final question is, if you guys could go back to the start of your journey, start of your careers, what advice would you give yourself? The answer's in the glass in front of you. Maybe that. It's very profound, Mike. <laughs> what about you, Nigel? What would you say to that 18-year-old working in the hotel in Wales? Just, um, you know, enjoy it. Um, as I say, I'm very lucky in the fact that um, wine has opened lots of doors for me. And uh, in terms of sort of, um, it is a fantastic subject. And I think there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of snobbism about wine, which is not needed i think you know today sort of wine is accessible for everyone and i think sort of in terms of um you know sort of for people that are going to do exams and do qualifications uh, enjoy it um you know it 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 does involve commitment uh, don't ever think sort of you know it's like most things in life that just you know you have to if you're going to do something get right behind it but you have to enjoy it. How important is it? Final, final question. Um, how important is it to have had those formative people, those formative individuals in your life early in your career who opened that door for you? And is that almost a responsibility once you're, once you're in the industry, once you're in the club, to then pay that forward down the line? Yeah, you know, for, for me, you know, as I say, sort of, um, I was very, very lucky. Um, you could say I was in, in the wrong place at the wrong time, or you could say I was in the right place at the right time. And, um, you know, I, I, if it wasn't for, you know, me being 18 and failing my A-levels and being given this opportunity, I, I really don't know what I'd be doing now. Um, but since passing the Master Sommelier, you know, as I said, I, I've been very, very lucky. And for me, you know, sort of teaching the first... MS course in Mumbai uh, was, um, was, was, was a great honor. Teaching the first um, MS course in Johannes in Johannesburg in, in South Africa was a great honor. And I think sort of, I'm sure Mike will agree, it's, it's, it is a case of sort of giving back and sort of, um, you know, sort of doing as much as you can to help promote the world of wine and to encourage and to dispel any sort of myths that, that might be there. Yeah. What about yeah. you, Mike? Um, <clears throat> Nigel and I, I think, are, are good examples of people who are, as we said at the start, people who <coughs> come around in the wine business or, or you know, weren't, um, didn't come out of the, uh, there seems to be some sort of cliche about, you know, go to the right school, know the right people, get into the wine trade that way, but that's not how it worked for us, and we, and we managed to sort of reach, the, reach the, the pinnacle of the wine qualifications and and be sort of really in amongst it in terms of the the wine trade here in the UK. 
Um, the uh, a good uh, a, a mentor of mine, a chap called Kim Milne, who's a winemaker in Australia. Um, I, I worked in his winery in 2014, and he, um, after I'd finished the, the vintage, I said I was going to go and visit some wineries around Australia, and he gave me a uh, two days later a spreadsheet of about. 12 wineries where he'd phoned them up and said, oh, I've got this guy coming from England. Can you make sure you show him around and look after him? And these were, you know, top wineries and the, the, the chief winemakers or the owners of these estates. And there's no Eventbrite ticket for that. You can't go and buy that anywhere. It doesn't, it's not for sale. And um, so it's a wonderful thing to be given things that you actually can't pay back. Uh, you actually have to, you know, pay them forward. So um, that's the responsibility to 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 keep um, to keep uh, growing the industry. So it's a, it's a great privilege to be able to do that. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Two great answers. Thank you very much, guys. Um, if you are interested at all in either of the wines that we've tasted today, um, they are both available through Boutonnet International. Get in touch with your Boutonnet representative if you want to know any more. Um, I know that Nigel and Mike will be on a couple of sessions over the next few days as well. So they'll be around for any other questions, but you can always just send us an email if you want any further questions at all. Uh, and yeah, thank you for tuning in. Please join us for our next session, which is Boutinot in the new world and how we, uh, how we manage own production there without actually having vineyards on the ground. Um, so hope to see you there. Thank you very much for joining guys. Thank you. Thank you.